So hey, I'm here with Felix Zemdex. He's broken the world record over 100 times, uh, currently holds 10 separate average and single world records, is the two-time Rubik's Cube world champion. Thank you for joining me. No worries. Thanks for having me. Thanks for the introduction. <laughs> Thank you. Well, also congratulations on the multiple world records a couple weeks ago at Worlds. Oh, cheers. That was, yeah, that was a lot of fun. Yeah. And also I received the money transfer, so we won't be talking about zeroing or your rice pudding recipe. Very good, very good. I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> yeah, and for everyone else, uh, so it's like 7 a.m. my time, 9 p.m. his time. So if we both look tired, there's completely different reasons for that. Um, now, it's against... <laughs> well, I did get I did get up at midday, but I'm, oh. <laughs> I'm fine, so no worries. <laughs> so uh, one thing, you before we get to Worlds, uh, Latin America Tour. Now, I didn't even realize this, that it's like a tour. Like, there were eight stops. Uh, yeah, that was it. So... It was in June and then the start of July. Yeah, we went to eight different competitions. Well, a group of us went to mostly eight different competitions across seven different countries. Mm -hmm. um, there was one weekend where it was split, so the group kind of split up. But, yeah, it was uh, kind of crazy. How did that work then with the different groups? What was the best part of that, I guess, even? Um, uh, for me, the best part was just being able to travel around and visit all sorts of different Cuban communities. I mean, like... Cubing is a pretty global thing. Um, I'm not sure, but many people realize, like, particularly on things like Facebook groups and YouTube and, and maybe even the Reddit, the subreddit, it seems pretty US centric, but literally it's it, cubing's big, well, growing and big all around the world. And so having the chance to visit, yeah, so seven different countries and compete in eight different competitions was pretty cool just to see, I guess, what the different cubing communities are like. Um, there's you know some similarities in the in the um, in the scenes in South America, but there's also some differences in different countries. So yeah, that was it was heaps of fun, and yeah, it was, it was pretty crazy. What kind of differences do you mean? Um, oh, just like slight variations in you know the way they run competitions. Um, some communities are obviously a little bit newer than others, um, so there's less maybe there was less experienced people there to help out and organize and delegate. So you know in certain competitions, I had to have a little bit of a bigger role in helping out scrambling and, and that sort of thing. But other, in other places, you know, every, everything ran really smoothly. For the most part, everything ran really smoothly. Um, and then just, I don't know, like in different countries, some of the people are differently, uh, act differently. So like some people are more, I don't know, more like excited and I wouldn't say warm, but like, yeah, more excited and like keen to talk to you. Whereas in other countries, some people are more shy, um, it's particularly with the language barrier. Um, I, I don't speak much any Spanish, really. I've picked up a couple of words and phrases on the trip, but that was something that was a little bit tricky for some people. You know, if I and me and a bunch of other fast cubers come to the country and they want to talk, but it, it can be difficult sometimes. But yeah, no, it was, it was great. It was great. Do you know any other languages? Uh, no, nah, I did. I did French uh, in high school, but I've forgotten oh, a lot cool. of that. We'll speak like yeah. half that. I'm horrible <laughs> at French too. Okay. Uh, so right. uh, moving on a little bit with Worlds, I don't want to actually uh, go into too much. I mean, talk as much as you want about uh, Worlds. You, you made a post on Facebook, which was sure. great. I, everyone just go to his Facebook page. I'll put a link in the description too. Just you've made a post kind of going through a bunch of stuff, which was awesome. Um, yeah, I uh, do, a couple of things. Yeah. yeah. I do want to talk about kind of the, the contra... Uh, there are some timer issues. And my, my question right. is, what happened? Because I see posts online and I feel like people are posting things just from assumptions. So I'm just kind of curious because right. you were there. <laughs> what yeah. exactly was going on with that? Yeah. So um, I think, so at the, at the world championships, um, the timers didn't have what are called O-rings, which are used at some competitions to cover the reset and the, and the power button so that it's less likely that they are accidentally hit. And so if people do like a fast timer stop and their thumb accidentally hits the reset button, then without these O-rings, the timers are more likely to, well, not, not malfunction. They're doing what, what, mm -hmm. what you do, which is press the reset button. But unfortunately, you know, in the solve, if you're trying to solve quickly and stop the timer very quickly, then people can hit the reset button. And unfortunately, yeah, a, a couple of kind of big resets happened. So the first one was in the 4x4 final. Mm -hmm. So Sebastian Weyer, he started, his first solve was a 24, and then he got a 27, and then he got a 19, and then a 20, which is like back-to-back. -back. That was absolutely insane, mm -hmm. like getting those sorts of times in a world's final. And then in the last solve, he was, it was 
going to stop the timer at around 24 seconds, which would have been a new world record average and would have like completely sealed him the victory. And then his timer reset when he stopped the timer on the last solve. And so that was pretty upsetting because like he's the four by four King, like mm-hmm. completely deserved to win. And so to have that bit of doubt, having to watch like me and Bill Wang do our last solves with the chance that he would lose it was pretty devastating. And yeah, so he stopped the timer and it reset and, yeah, the standard procedure in that case is a DNF and they kind of waited around for a little bit and then he walked off and, yeah, everyone applauded. And then luckily he was still good enough to actually win even with that DNF. But, yeah, that was like that was the good time of reset because he still won. Mm-hmm. Um, but in the 3x3 final, um, I wasn't watching. I was backstage waiting to solve. But Sung Hyuk Nam got a DNF on his first 3x3 solve, I think, and it would have been like a low to mid six-second solve, which would have, if he'd done the... Uh, solves afterwards in the same manner, in the same times, then he would have won the world championships. But it's always hard to say yeah, you know, whether that what exactly would, would have changed things. Um, and he was given a, uh, an extra attempt, at, but then they re- recalled that. It was like a provisional extra attempt just in case um, they actually deemed it to be a timer malfunction rather than stopping the timer. But he still came second. But yeah, that one, that one was slightly more disappointing because it actually affected the final result. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was one, because uh, I, I would see people online saying maybe it was battery of exactly what happened there, but that's that's good to clarify that. Yeah, um, it, yeah we're, for the most part, it's just people hitting the reset button with their thumb, mm-hmm. which is which is preventable. I mean, a lot of people were talking about, you know, we need to, through the WCA or whatever means, like, you know, re, uh, redesign the timers so that that sort of thing isn't possible. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe, you know, when, when, when the time is running, it's not possible, like, just disable the reset button, some function within the timer to reset, disable the reset button, which would be, I think, the easiest solution. But there's multi, like various different ways you can actually avoid that sort of thing happening. But getting that actually done practically is, is very difficult and challenging. Yeah. So so I want to move on a little bit. Uh, Cube Skills, you have a website. Mm-hmm. Now, yeah. did you build this website? Is this like all of you or did someone else help you with it? What's How'd that come about? Um, so I'd always wanted to make a bunch of tutorials and like a lot of tutorials, very comprehensive tutorials. Mm -hmm. Because when I was starting out speed cubing and I think still now, like there's so many different resources online and a lot of them are good. A lot of them are not so good. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's kind of hard for beginners to discern between, you know, what's good, like going to Bad Mephisto's site and what learning from there versus just clicking around random tutorials on the internet and yeah, I, pe- like people always ask me how to get faster. You know, do you have some advice? And I always used to like write out these long replies, like yeah, blah, blah, here's this, 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 and th- send that to a bunch of different people. Mm-hmm. But putting something together, comprehensive together, like Cube Skills, was I guess an easy way for me to say, okay, you can just go and learn from here. And then I guess I wanted to. Uh, so I studied commerce, uh, economics in school, but I learned a little bit a few things here here and there about business. So I also wanted to make this an opportunity to start out like a, a small online business for myself and, you know, learn some things from that. So there is like a, it, there's a monetized element to it. Um, but I kind of see it as, you know, you make a free account, you can pretty much get everything you need there. And then a, a subscription is like for people who really want to support the site or want a little bit extra. Um, and yeah, it's been heaps of fun going quite well. I worked quite hard on that throughout the first six months of this year before I went away. Um, basically, I do pretty much everything except for the web design aspect. So I'm working with a, a guy here who's actually a Cuba. He comes to some competitions, um, but he's yeah he's a web developer and a software guy, and he does all the web design and anything we need. We can I work on with him, and it's all pretty much customizable. It's cu- a custom build website. So I was able to like design completely the layout of the website and everything like that. And with a website, you can do so many different and extra things in addition to just like chucking videos on YouTube. And that's yeah. something I've really enjoyed doing. And then, yeah, I do everything. I do all the videography, editing, like tutorial development, custom service, emails, everything like that. Um, it's been fun, but yeah, hard work. Hard yeah. work. Yeah, I was like, um, so talk about with the... Uh... Uh, if Wikipedia is completely accurate, um, you're interning, doing like investment strategy kind of stuff. Uh, yes. Yeah, so, so I finished up that. I finished that up before I went away. So a couple of months ago, I finished 
up there and I'm going back to school this semester, but only studying part time. Okay, so um, is this or could this be a full time? Could cubing be a full time job? Um, for me, at the moment, like it, it definitely is, and it it, it pretty much is. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm studying part time. Um, I mean, there's a few different ways I make it my job. The first is like sponsorship. So I guess with GANCube, they sponsor me and they're very generous and I do some, you know, a few things here and there for them. Um, and then there's things like you know, YouTube AdSense is really good. Then there's a lot of ad hoc. I do occasionally like ad hoc, I don't know, performances or like random entertainment things. And then I guess Cube Skills is another element on top of that. And yeah, we, we, if, you, if you sum up all of those different parts, it's definitely... I would definitely consider it a full-time job. But for me, it's still a hobby, even though I'm able to, you know, live off it as a student. Yeah. Understandable. As a musician, understandable. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, so you, you, you work, uh, I, don't know, I was going to say you work with GAN, but you're, you're, I guess we'll start off with a little bit with GAN. Um, the yeah. SM, you, you set the world record yeah. average with the SM. Some people have yeah. unboxed the SM, and I feel like it's still speculation of what it is. What is the right. SM? So I wasn't, I'm not heavily involved in design, the design process there. Gan mm -hmm. just pretty much said, we're coming out with this. Here's some cubes. And he sent them to me before I went away. Mm -hmm. The SM, from my understanding, is an upgrade on the, so the, the Air S is an upgrade on the regular Gan 356 Air. And to the best of my understanding, there's a slight, I think there's an upgraded core there is it's a lighter cube so i assume he's modified the pieces in some way i haven't really looked very deeply into it um so it's slightly lighter upgraded core and the upgraded uh ges nuts so those are the nuts that go in in the cube uh but yeah don't don't question me on technicals i'm not too sure <laughs> you'd have to wait to ask or see when it when it's released to actually get more in detail answers um yeah, I'm not too sure, but essentially it's an upgrade on the regular air and the SM is just the magnetized version of it, which, you know, everyone uses magnets these days. Okay. Yeah. And it's, um, so yeah, I guess I'll kind of, I'll, I'll stop with that, but there's a two by two. That no, sure. The, there's a Rubik's two by two that he's working with. Um, any info on that at least? Um, yeah, so. I didn't really know this was happening, uh, or I ha had a vague idea, but I didn't know it was ready. So at the World Championships, Gan, Gan was there with his wife and his little baby, and because he's doing some things with Rubik's, designing the Rubik's Speed Cube, um, he's also, I guess, been commissioned to build a 2x2 two two for them, and I believe he's working on his own 2x2, two two, like a Gan-branded 2x2, two two, but don't quote me on that. Um, but he, yeah, he had these Rubik's 2x2s two ready. I'm pretty sure they were the, the final version. I'm, I'm not 100% sure, but um, I'd, be, I'd been using, like, my Diane 2x2 two two for seven years and never really looked I'm, – I'm not really a 2x2 two two pro, so I don't, you know, get all the new 2x2s two two and try them out. But the Rubik's 2x2, two two, yeah, it was a stickerless, slightly smaller version, um, slightly smaller size 2x2, two two, and I really liked how it turned, so – I guess used it at Worlds, but I didn't get any great results. But yeah, it's it's quite a nice two by two, and yeah, I, I enjoy it. Okay. Um. Well, speaking of two by two, um, a lot of people on a lot of the questions, people I guess assume you don't do two by two or like Mega Minx or a blind just because you don't have records in it. I do. Yet. I do Mega Minx. Yeah. I do Mega Minx. Um. Well, like with with two by two, so you're you're still your average is twentieth in the world, which is I mean. Last time I checked, my average is ten thousand ninety sixth. So, yeah, yeah. Um, is is something like since two by two is one of the end by end puzzles? Um, yeah, is is something different about it solving wise that makes it a harder barrier? Is it like does it feel different solving, or is it just that there's a ton of great two by two solvers? Um, for me, the reason that I'm slightly slower at two by two is because uh, probably because a couple of reasons so firstly um i don't know nearly as many al algorithms as some other people so to be a fast two by two solver now you need to know like full eg to need to be world class you probably need to know full eg which is like the method which is cll plus mm -hmm. um swapping the adjacent or opposite uh, corners on the bottom layer and then probably some tricks in addition to that so i don't i don't know any of that i just use CLL, cll so that's already like a big disadvantage i also don't practice two by two mm -hmm. um and i think the other thing well one thing that's really hard about two by two is 
to be world class or very competitive is, you know, the event's so short you you can't really make a mistake. Um, so it's kind of a high pressure event. Um, and I don't know. I, I used to be very competitive and and quite good at it, but kind of yeah, left it by the wayside as I've gone and you know practice more bigger cubes and things like that. What's your practice kind of session like? That was asked a lot. <laughs> How do you practice? What is that? Um, it's pretty freeform, um, to be honest. Uh, I'm kind of always practicing three by three. Like I'll always be, you know, in a week or in a, in a couple of weeks, I'll always do a few three by three sessions here and there. And then otherwise it kind of depends how I feel, depends if I have a competition coming up. So if I have a comp coming up and there's like four by four and one handed and it's kind of a one day comp, then I'll just focus on those events and not worry about the other cubes. But if I have a big competition um, with, you know, all sorts of events that I'll have to kind of spread my practice out a little bit more, but I'm generally practicing three by three and one or two other events. Mm -hmm. Um, so practice involves, I guess, doing time solves and time sessions. And then in, in addition to that, sometimes I kind of highlight a weakness or something I really need to work on. So in the lead up to, to the world championships or probably to, more towards the start of the year, one of the things I was working on was like last layer speed and last layer turning consistency. Mm -hmm. So, I kind of figured that well, I, I kind of realized that my last layer, um, I was a little bit inconsistent and watching other people on YouTube, they were probably turning slightly faster and, and turning more accurately, particularly someone like Max Park, mm -hmm. like you never see him mess up any of his last layer algorithms. Whereas if you watch my official selves, I, I mess up far more frequently. So that was something I was working on. And to do that, I kind of, you know, honed in on, on, on all my algorithms. So practice all my algorithms over and over again, made sure my finger tricks were safe. Um, that's something that's quite important is to use like safe finger tricks as opposed to fancy or risky finger tricks. Mm -hmm. And then did things like last slot and last layer practice. So go on QQ timer and do a last slot and last layer scramble and then just do sessions of those and with the focus on just like turning quickly and accurately. Well, with algorithms, I was looking at, you did a reconstruction of five solves. I can't remember what five they were. Um, I don't know, maybe it was the record ones? You, like, did some commentary on it. Yeah, 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 the 5.97 average. And yeah. I just reconstructed, or I, I got the reconstructions and added some commentary. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, one of them, um, you just did, like, an edge orientation, like the F, R, U, R prime, U prime, F prime, and then <laughs> ZBLL. Yeah. Now, yeah. so two questions on that. <laughs> one is, yeah. um, when you're learning new algorithms, is it, to, to try to find more efficient ways of solving it. And the other question is, is do you, do you feel that that, that doing that edge orientation and the ZBLL is something that could end up being faster yeah. or is it just for kicks? <laughs> um, so wait, what was the first question? Sorry. Oh, sorry. I don't even remember. Um, it was, okay. Oh, as far as learning new algorithms, is it, um, shoot, I don't remember what I asked. Sorry. Right. Um, so <laughs> the, the reason I do the, the, the edge orientation and, the, and and then ZBLL is because – so it's it's with this OLO case where we have the line and then you have this thing. Mm -hmm. So the corners are headlights there and headlights there. And this OLO case, it's not great. Um, it's one of the, one of the pr probably – definitely in the slower half of OLLs. And if you do true rough, so F, U, R, U, R prime, U prime, F prime from this angle, I get this T case. Mm-hmm. Um, the T case and for the T cases, I know most of the ZBLLs or at least like 60 or 70% of them. So there's a fair chance that if I do free rough and then, um, if I do free rough, then I'll get a ZBLL after that, which I think on average, um, if you kind of do it, you know, many, many times, um, will be faster than doing the OLL and then the PLL algorithm. If you say that ZBLL is maybe, I don't know, if doing one of these ZBLs is maybe slightly slower than PLL um, because of the recognition involved, but doing through rough is at least like 0.5 faster than the regular OLL algorithm, I would say. So you, uh, on average, I, I would think you were saving, for me, I'm saving time by doing through rough and then this ZBLL uh, rather than OLL and then PLL. Okay. Um, and when you're learning new algorithms with, let's say, the ZBL, uh, ZBLL ones, What's your way of yeah. working on those? I know you said in one video, it might have been like a cubing world thing, um, that right. just working on them through solves is often nice because then you actually, your your hand is in different places. You're working on finger tricks different ways instead of just correct, correct. repeat. So what what's your way of learning yeah. the new algorithms? So to to learn the algorithm, you repeat it. Like to actually learn the moves, right? 
So it's just a matter of repeating and knowing the patterns within the algorithm and figuring out your finger tricks. But then you'll see off very often with people that know ZBLL uh, in their soul, say I'll have a massive pause for recognition. Um, and you know, it's one thing to be able to do an algorithm over and over again with your hands in the same position um, without any recognition, but to actually implement that in your solves is is far more difficult. And the hard thing about ZBLL is it's not like PLL where there's only 21 cases and you get the cases really, really frequently because there's you know nearly 500 cases of ZBLL. You come across the algorithms far more rarely, uh, like far less frequently. And so you have far less of a chance to actually practice each algorithm. So if you only get you know each ZBLL in every 500 solves, um, then you're not going to be able to practice it. You know, you're going to get the case like, yeah, you're going to get the case one in 500 solves. You're not going to be able to practice it very often. Yep. So something you can do, I guess, is try and you know set up the ZBLL and then like unscramble an F2L pair or, or something like that. Or alternatively, you could, yeah, so unscramble the F2L pair, solve the F2L pair, and then like re re-recognize the ZBLL. Or you have stuff like ZBLL trainers. So on QQ time or, el or elsewhere, you can select just a ZBLL scrambler. There's a really good site by Roman Strakov from Russia. It's called bestsiteever.ru, and you can select a subset of ZBLL algorithms, and it'll give you scrambles, and you can time your recognition and execution of those. The far more important thing with ZBLL is being able to practice your recognition and recall of the algorithm, because if you're learning ZBLL, you're probably already very confident competent at actually learning different moves and finger tricks but yeah, it's the recall and the recognition that's really hard and that's that takes far more time than actually learning the actual algorithm with all that practice then um i i saw something on reddit from like four years ago and you mentioned something about possible uh, actually let me let me backtrack for a second because i'm sure. trying to incorporate other people's questions uh because there's like yeah, there's yeah, a yeah. few hundred and there are mainly yeah. things that i was already going to ask so Loco the Puffy Ninja from Instagram asked, have you ever had any physical yeah. hardships due to cubing? So I was going to ask, um, are, you um, are you experiencing any cubing injuries? Like uh, you mentioned in that Reddit post, our RSI, repetitive strain injury. Have you noticed any of that? Um, very rarely. There was a time, I think it was maybe around four years ago before the 2013 World Championships, like my forearms on both sides were kind of really tight and I was getting muscle pains mm -hmm. in them. Um, and I kind of went to like... I think it was a physical therapist or just like a masseuse. And basically, yeah, she just like, kind of massaged my arms and just said, if it gets worse, like come back. Um, like my the muscles in my arms are, are pretty tight. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I, I can't really remember what happened. But yeah, she kind of ma massaged them and it went away for a little bit but and never really came back. Um, but I still think my muscles in my forearms are, are quite tight. But it's nothing that pains me or anything like that. And I've never really had any problems with, like, my hands or my muscles in my thumb or anything like that. Okay. Um, that's that's good to know <laughs> right now. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I actually I meant to, to bring this up back when we were talking about Worlds. So you mentioned you were the oldest one in that finals, in that, in the... Um, yeah. And you're, you're 21 now, yeah. right? Yeah. And you were growing a beard... My question is, uh, when did was. you get old? <laughs> what? Why when did, did I you get, get old? old? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Are you going to keep growing the beard? Slows me. Uh, oh, I don't know. I didn't mind it. It didn't look very good in the videos, but Matt's, Matt's told me that when he saw it in real life, it was slightly better, but I still need to work on it. But he said it looked much better in real life than it did in the videos. Um, but basically, well, the reason I was just growing it was because I couldn't be bothered slash didn't have time to shave when I was away in, mm -hmm. in South America, but I shaved it off before the world championships because yeah, it was kind of messy. Um, it might come back, but huh. well, we're all in your sure. watch. I'll, I'll figure that out. Okay. All right. <laughs> um, and so you see fop for three by three, Yao for four by four. Uh, have you yeah. ever like. I'm sure you've tried it, but have you ever really worked at things like Ruzi, Z, Hoya, and, and spent a long time working on those ones? No, I haven't really spent much time on them. I've just done some solos for fun and, mm -hmm. you know, learned the method and, and practice it. Like, yeah, not, not much at all. Um, one thing that I did a little bit on the Latin America tour was practice Yao on 5x5, five five, and that's something that I might, if I have time, practice for the rest of this year and see how that goes because I think it has potential to be maybe slightly faster or – maybe not, um, than just regular reduction. So we'll see how that goes. 
Oh, and I forgot to bring this up earlier when we were talking about the reconstructions. So, Cubing Gavins, I believe it's pronounced from Instagram, you have you have right. posted that you have a three point zero one second solve. Um, any uh, yeah, how so. what happened? What is that? Can you walk through that solve for us? Release the last layer. What exactly? Any um, why it was so fast? <laughs> why it was so fast is basically a three move. Three move extended cross mm -hmm. uh, in which I could easily see the next two F2L pairs. Then I did my last F2L pair and got a PLL skip. Um, I did that one while warming up at World Championships for the first round. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I had some people next to me. I had Max Park next to me. He was kind of excited by it. He yelled, yelled out to his mom, Mom, Felix got a, got a 3.01. <laughs> so it was, it was kind of funny. Um, but yeah, just I think it was 36 moves. Um, I was obviously using my phone as a timer. So I mean, it's still valid. I still started and stopped it. Mm -hmm. Before I finished, and, before I started and finished the soul, mm -hmm. but um, yeah, just a really easy soul with a PLL skit. Basically, the last layer was last layer was this case. Mm -hmm. It's just like an anti soon, and then free rough, and no okay. AUF. I don't think I need to change my OLL for that because I think what I'm doing is horrible. Uh yeah, <laughs> I, I know the one you're thinking of. Yeah, I'm I'm doing some weird like uh, thing. I've got to like turn my hand so when I see it. Actually, let me see on. The yeah. The camera. Like yeah. I do this um, weird thing where I like have to really turn my hand and then do that. So it it orients yeah. it, but I've got to like do a weird thing. I mean, I would use that one for OLLCP. So if the corners were, if I had that uh, CLL case, mm -hmm. but that's probably not my standard go-to algorithm. Okay. Yeah, whenever I see that one, like, I groan internally when I'm, like, performing it. Like, this can't be good. Yeah. <laughs> Is your dad still practicing 3x3? Three three? Uh, I have no idea. He's still actually overseas. So he's, when they went to Paris, my mom and my dad, um, it was, like, the start of their holiday. I think mm -hmm. they were away for, going away for three weeks, and they're coming back middle of next week. Um, but, uh... Whether he's practicing, I'm not sure. I think he's maybe taking a little bit of a, bit of a break after the World Championships. It's a yeah. big weekend for him. Uh, there was a couple other things I was going to ask. I can't remember what was. I, like, right. I jumped around my little sheet that I made to try to make yeah, things yeah, yeah. flow, and I have no <laughs> idea where I'm at now. Um, I guess I'll, I'll just do a couple other questions from Instagram. Alex RBK yeah. asks if you've invented any methods or kind of uh, any, I'll add algorithms to that. Have you? created anything for a puzzle that hasn't really existed before so i'm not entirely sure but i think i may have put a name to something um or at least i, I i'm the one like i had, hadn't heard it from anywhere else mm -hmm. before i called it what it is and so maybe i'm the one that made the name or maybe someone else like simultaneously made the name for it but um it's what's known as anti-cll on two by two so it's basically it's like a it's like a cheating way of doing uh, EG2 or is it EG1? The, the case where you have diagonal swap of corners, okay. right? Um, so instead of actually learning the EG2 algorithms or whether it's EG1, I, can't, I don't know. I should know. Um, instead of actually doing the EG algorithm, what I did to kind of get around learning the algorithms is just so do the, do the face with the diagonal corner swap and then do the CLL case that would give you a diagonal swap on the corners on the top so let's say you have like, uh, oh, let me grab a cube. So let's say you have like your, your layer on the bottom with diagonal swap and then you have a soon on the top, but it's a diagonal soon. So if you do the soon, you get a diag case. Mm -hmm. um, basically what anti-CLL is, well, I think I called it that, but someone might, might you know, say that they called it that. Um, basically, you just do the soon and then cancel it into the R2, F2, R2 thing. Um, yeah, so it's just like a, a cheater's way of uh, doing okay. EG. What? So I, I think I called it that. I don't know if I invented it. Yeah. Um, but I kind of I kind of started using it on my own. Um, but yeah, probably other people started using it by themselves yeah. before. It was kind of shared. And there's so much, like, so many things out there. It's hard to really invent anything anymore or yeah, know exactly. if you're the first one exactly. to invent it yeah with, now with the not even enough time to shave do you have any other hobbies or anything besides cubing um 
No, not really. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I mean, just kind of just standard stuff like, I don't know, uh, like last year I was working part-time, you know, uni full-time mm-hmm. and just hanging out with friends and that sort of thing. So cubing was like, yeah, cubing's my main hobby and has been for the last, you know, nine years. Um, and yeah, I don't really play any sport, which is kind of bad. Um, I watch sport. The, the one sport that I really follow and watch is Australian rules football. Um, it's kind of a, a game we play here in Australia. It's, it's very, very popular. Um, other than that, yeah, just kind of hanging out with friends. Basically, that works. I, I, I used to play sports when I was younger, but I've got I, I throw some some frisbees in my backyard. That's pretty much it now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the so with all this with cubing, do you see ever a time when you like retire? Uh, I don't think I need to. Like, the I don't know. Some people, some people ask me like, when are you going to yeah. retire? Like. I don't see really many reasons why I would like retire. Like obviously there's going to come a stage where you know, I move on to other things or like practice less. But for me, like it's way too much fun, like going to competitions, going around the world. Like even, you know, when I'm 30 or 40, I still, I think I'll be going to like the world championships to meet up with friends, even if I'm, you know, no chance of making the finals. Mm-hmm. Um, just there's so much fun. It's such a great community. And you see like even the older guys who used to be really fast back in the day, like Eric Ackersdijk still goes to heaps of competitions. He was even commenting, commentating like the three by three finals this time. So it's Mm -hmm. the community's too good for anyone to, for me to like want to ever leave it. And I made too many friends over the years to like, yeah, why would, why would I leave? But certainly there'll become a stage where, uh, uh, probably not for a little while where I'm like, yeah, getting pushed down the rankings, but I hope that doesn't come too soon. Um, <laughs> like definitely over, over over the last 12 months, you know, mm-hmm. many people have managed to catch up to me and overtake me in different uh, sorts of events, and that was inevitable, but I still want to try and stay pretty competitive. Is 3x3 three three your favourite thing to do, or, or do you enjoy other puzzles more? Uh, yeah, 3x3 three three is definitely my favourite event, for sure. Like, it's not fast enough that it's like all like luck based and you can't make any mistakes, but you can't really make too many mistakes these days. It's kind of the perfect speed for, for spectators. I think like a, an event that's over in, you know, less than eight seconds is, is pretty fun to watch. Mm-hmm. Is there anything you'd like to see added? Um, I know, I mean, there's not too much no, I can really no. think of is like mirror blocks and like that. If, they, if no. mirror blocks got added, would you start uh, working on that as well? Uh, if it got added to the WCA, yeah, I guess I'd practice it a little bit. And if it, I found if I found it fun enough, then I might make it like one of my competitive main events. Um, but I hope no more events get added. Uh, <laughs> There's already like, you know, big competitions already take three days, and these worlds were four days. Yeah. Um. So having adding more events just makes it less practical to have big competitions. Yeah. Anything big? Uh, I'm gonna start wrapping this up. Anything big in the next? year i guess as far as cube skills other places you're going anything exciting that's in the near future in the next year i guess if you can if you know something that's 10 years away you can you can oh, let no, us no, know no, about no. that too because <laughs> like in in 12 months time i imagine they'll have like the U- u.s nationals next year european championships asian championships mm-hmm. so i don't know to what subset of those i'll attend mm-hmm. um uh, but I'd like to get to maybe one or two of those in next summer. Um, but upcoming, uh, in the next couple of months, I do plan to go to China mm-hmm. um, a couple of times. So the first one is for this TV show. I don't know. I don't know really too many details about it, but I should be going there in about three weeks or so, just for five days to do some a TV show. And then later on, towards the uh, what's it called? It's like the big holidays in China, but they've got. That there's planned to be a Rubik's Cube competition and kind of a, I don't know, a festival sort of thing to celebrate 10 years of speed cubing in China mm-hmm. and going to visit the GAN factory and offices. Um, so those are kind of my two trips for the upcoming future for the rest of this year. And then next year, yeah. I mean, the, the big competitions are always in summer. Yeah. So I do plan to keep traveling and going to those. What's the, what's the uh, TV show for? There was a TV show you were on... I don't know if it was like a yeah. year ago or so that was... Yeah, um, early early last year, yeah. 
Mm-hmm. And that was called The Brain Trial. It's just like a fun game show. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I remember some of the like, promo photos with the, the very. Old... Yeah. <laughs> and they were, yeah. They were good. Uh, photos. I don't really. I don't really like the whole acting s- stuff. Like, yeah, but it, that it's a, like a genius into, thing. Just, yeah, no, exactly. That's they, they kind of have to do that for TV. I'm not really a huge fan of that. And, you know, they made me read these scripts. Like, you know, I'm Felix. I'm the best. I got like a billion records championships. <laughs> like, I, and I said, I don't, I don't want to read this, but they're like, oh, you, you know, you're participating in this, just do it. So I kind of had to give in and, and do that sort of thing. Um, so I'm not the biggest fan of that. I, I enjoyed the actual like ch- game show challenge itself. It was really fun being like in a team with John Franco. If, if you've seen the video, um, it's, it was kind of a team, sort of a team event. Um, yeah. I was a little confused made exactly solve, how it was working, but yeah. Yeah. They made me solve pyraminxes and scubes, uh, just to make it a little bit more fair. And also if you watch the video editing, they made it seem very, very close because they like overlaid like a fake timer on it. Mm. But the, on the real time, it, it wasn't it wasn't close. <laughs> we, won't, we won't mention that. So yeah, <laughs> I, I, but yeah, it's fun. And, and the TV show this August, uh, I think it's something similar, but maybe a little bit less dramatic. Yeah, it was it was dramatic, <laughs> to yeah. say the least. <laughs> yeah. Um. Okay, so I think I'm just gonna ask one more question. Uh, sure. Someone from Instagram. Oh man, the Shyam Peef Gupta. Um. It's just. What are your suggestions for new cubers? And I guess I'm going to kind of elaborate, not so much, you know, how to get fast, but just what would you say to someone who's starting out? My number one thing would be to go to a competition if you have one around your area. I think that's where you, that's even, even nowadays, that's where I learn the most things is by going to a competition and talking to people. Well, talking to Jay McNeil, he just teaches me everything. Um, but you go to a competition, get involved with the community. It's going to be a lot more fun because if you're if you're practicing at home and I don't know, it, it can be kind of well, not lonely, but it, cubing can sometimes be a little bit of a solitary activity. Um, it, but if you get involved with the community, even if that's just online, you know, there's uh, a couple of Facebook groups, there's speed solving forums, there's a subreddit, there's YouTube. So there's plenty of ways to get involved with the community online. Um, but I would say, particularly if you're a beginner, try to avoid like posting in too many places um try and lurk and read and you know extract knowledge that way rather than you know bugging people and, and posting um just because there's many questions that uh people ask or beginners would ask all the time and the answers are absolutely everywhere if you just search so yeah uh that's those are kind of my tips get, get involved with the community and there's a good site for tips at uh, keepskills.com yeah, and there's plenty of other great sites for tips as well. <laughs> but yeah, my, mine's, I, I think mine's quite good for CFOP tutorials. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you so, so much for, for coming on the podcast. No problem. Thanks for having me. So once again, I want to thank Felix for being on the podcast. If you listen to this on iTunes, um, feel free to head over to cubeskills.com. That is his site. It has a bunch of tutorials. Um, if you want to enter the giveaway, go to speedcubeview.com slash podcast. You can also send in questions as well for me to answer on the show. Also, if you're on iTunes, please leave a review. It greatly helps the show out. If you're on YouTube, I split this video up. So the first half with going over what's new, new cubes, new records will be in a separate video. Please hit like and subscribe. Of course, there'll be links in the description to all things Felix. Thank you very much, and I'll talk to you guys next time.